Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to SciLab. Um, I'm, I'm really excited to welcome everyone here today uh, for our panel discussion. Um, we, we are really delighted to be hosting the Pennsylvania premiere of the Code 2600 movie tonight. And so today we wanted to uh, take the opportunity to talk with the filmmaker and talk about some of the themes in the film, which um, uh, are very relevant to the kind of work that we do here at SciLab. Um, to start with, I want to introduce our panelists. Um, immediately to my left is uh, Jeremy Zarencheck, who is the filmmaker of Code 2600. Um, he is an award-winning documentary filmmaker who um, is actually from Pittsburgh, um, although he's living in Ohio now. Um, he uh, joined the Army National Guard after high school so that he could afford to pursue film studies in college. Um, and he, he started out at Penn State and then had to leave school when his unit was deployed in Iraq. Um, he brought his um, uh, movie equipment with him uh, to Iraq um, and uh, collected uh, 56 hours of footage, which he later edited into the 2008 documentary, Land of Confusion. And then uh, his, his next documentary film is Code 2600. Uh, to his left, uh, I have uh, Nicholas Kristen, who is the associate director of the INI and a SciLab faculty member here. He does research in a variety of areas, include, including online crime modeling, security economics, security and psychology, smartphone security, and other topics. And then to his left is Norman Sade, who is a professor in the School of Computer Science and director of the Mobile Commerce Lab and eSupply Chain Management Lab. Um, he's also co-director of the T PhD program in Computation, Organization, and Society. And he's um, co-director uh, with myself of the new master's program in privacy that we are launching here at Carnegie Mellon. Um, so I think that's uh, enough of introductions. Um, we're going to get started. Um, so to start with, um, I wanted uh, to ask Jeremy to tell us a little bit about uh, why he um, decided to make this film and what were some of the most surprising things that, that he learned in the process of making this film. Sure. Uh, first, I just want to thank uh, you, Lori, and uh, CMU and Scilabs for having me. It's uh, an absolute uh, pleasure for me to be here today and to be uh, premiering, doing the P Pennsylvania premiere of the film later this evening. Uh, in the summer of 2008, at a, when, while attending a film festival in Los Angeles, I met an individual um, that was a former intrusion detection specialist for the Federal Reserve. He had um, spent a lot of his adolescence uh, doing black hat, black hat activity, and then obviously had moved on to more of the uh, white hat side of the spectrum. Um, after befriending him and picking his brain for two days, I returned to Pittsburgh uh, inspired of this, this story and this concept of doing a cinematic representation of you know, the history of the, uh, you know, the coming of the information technology age. And you know, when I decided to go ahead and do extensive research into that story and check my facts and what I understood and learn more, of course, what I found was a history that was uh, rich and untold, and a story of an expansive world that uh, I felt was very underrepresented. And when it was represented in mainstream media, was done through hyperbole and fabrication uh, that you know had very little, if any, regard for the facts. So um, I decided to pursue this as my next documentary feature film. And in doing that, uh, it became this kind of balancing act between accuracy and entertainment uh, so that I could screen the film in front of IT professionals like yourself and other you know, people that work in this industry in security and for them to be entertained and also not be insulted by anything that I was slinging at them uh, you know, that was sensationalist and not necessarily true. Also, that I can make a film that, you know, basically what I call the popcorn eaters could enjoy. And uh, it became this balancing act of accuracy and entertainment. But three and a half years later, uh, here I am, and the, the film has traveled well and continues to do so. All right. Um, so do you want to show us the first clip? And Sure. Uh, so the first clip is a part of one of the longer scenes in the film 
that kind of dives into the history of phone freaking. I found phone freaking as a kind of very representational chapter in this history that most people could digest because I could explain the zeros and ones of phone freaking and how that worked and how blue boxes worked and what the t significance of the 2600 megahertz tone was and people, again, the popcorn eaters and such, could understand this and wrap their minds around it. So I thought it was a good example. So I kind of embellished in this history a little bit here, as you'll see. That's just for rich men and gabby women. Nothing but a gadget. Oh, he says that, does he? Well, you listen to me, Mr. Kendall. You've got an uncle who's a fool, and you can quote me. You're talking to a man who helps install one of the very first switchboards there ever was, back in New Haven in 78, who helped string the first line between cities, from Boston to Providence. A man who's seen what this telephone has done for the country already in 25 years. A gadget, is it? One thing to keep in mind as you're talking about the phone company in the 1960s and 70s and even up into the early 80s, for the most part, it really is one giant company that was all run by AT&T, American Telephone and Telegraph, was a monopoly. It was, in fact, the largest company on Earth. Today's telephone network far exceeds Mr. Bell's grandest dream. And every last inch of it can be linked together to serve the home, business, or continental defense. The very size and diversity of this network helped to make it strong. The telephone system was the closest thing that anybody got to a computer, and the sophistication of the telephone system and the telephone network was really approaching that of a computer. And so the phone company was really sort of the forerunner of a lot of computing. Phone freaks were, you know, today they'd be called network hackers, right? The only difference is they're playing around with the telephone. Finally tonight, we have a report on phone freaks, underground hobbyists who make illegal phone calls around the country by confounding the technology of the telephone companies with technology of their own. For this phone freaking business to make any sense at all, you, you almost have to get in the time machine because you have to go back in time to a time that is really unlike today. That in the very old days, when you wanted to make a long-distance call, what you did was you picked up the telephone and you talked to an operator. And you said, I want to call Chicago, and here's my phone number. That operator would get another operator on the line, which might involve maybe a couple intermediate cities, and you'd eventually get to Chicago. So there were human beings in the loop the whole way through. What made phone freaking possible was when that started to get automated, where operators started to get out of the loop so that you could actually use automated equipment to place a call from, you know, San Francisco to Chicago. And what that meant, the automated equipment had some vulnerabilities in it, which allowed somebody with a little bit of technical skill to be able to place their own calls or reroute the calls or otherwise play with things. John Draper, who's uh, known as his phone freak handle as Captain Crunch, was the guy who discovered something really interesting about Captain Crunch cereal. Back in the day, Captain Crunch cereal came with a little prize, and one of the prizes was a little tiny whistle, a little plastic whistle, and it turned out that if you covered up one of the holes in the whistle, it actually allowed you to generate a perfect 2600 hertz tone, and that you could use to whistle your way into free phone calls. So if you were good at whistling and you could whistle 2600 hertz, um, you could actually whistle your way to free phone calls. And there were several people who could do that. The most famous was a phone freak uh, at the time known as Joe Ingressia, later known as Joy Bubbles, who was uh, a blind fellow, gifted with perfect pitch, and able to whistle free phone calls. Let's see if I make it this time. This is really hard to do. It sounded like all the tones were present, so the phone should be ringing about now. Okay, it hit the phone. It just takes a little while to... Now From his one phone to a town in Illinois and back to his other phone, a thousand-mile phone call by whistling. So this is a huge problem because we're not talking about software today where you just patch a few lines of code and, you know, mail out a CD-ROM or have people download updates from the Internet. This is physical plant. This is, you know, central offices all throughout the country that are using, you know, big, huge racks of equipment that this has got to change if you want to patch this hole. In addition, phone calls were really expensive. It might cost, you know, the equivalent in today's dollars of $55 for a 10-minute uh, phone call from San Francisco to New York, right? It was really expensive. Long distance was a big deal back then.
Everyone knows long distance rates are lowest at night. But did you know those same low rates are in effect all day on Sunday? You can make a three minute station to station call to any of 48 states for 90 cents or less anytime on Sunday. The way a blue box worked is it was based on the observation that when a line is idle, there's this 2600 hertz tone on it. So the first thing you do with a blue box is once you've dialed a long distance call and the call is starting to go through, you would send a burst of 2600 down the line. And that 2600 hertz would confuse the remote central office. And now they're again listening for those, they're called multi-frequency digits. So a blue box is kind of like a touch tone generator that can generate these special digits. And with those, you can now dial your own call. So if you were a bookmaker, uh, as part of organized crime, you spent a lot of time on the telephone. That cost you a lot of money in the 1960s. And even worse, it left telephone records that the FBI could later get to figure out who your associates were. If you were using a blue box, you didn't have to do that. The problem the phone company had is that they had, from the 1940s on, based their entire network and infrastructure around this multi-frequency signaling system. They had been rolling this out across the entire United States. They'd spent a lot of money on this. And then it turns out that, well, it's got this problem that, you know, a guy with a blue box and a tone generator, or even a guy who can whistle, can make free phone calls. And some estimates at the time were that it would be, you know, upwards of a billion dollars, and this is back when a billion dollars was real money, to fix this whole thing. So you've got this vulnerability. What do you do about it? You can't make it go away overnight. You know, even if you had a billion dollars, you couldn't make it go away overnight. So then you, you get into this problem of, well, we're obviously going to have to live with this for a while. But at the same time, we want to keep this as quiet as possible so that, you know, it doesn't get out that we have this problem. But then how do you, what do you do when you catch somebody, when you catch a college kid who's figured out how to make a blue box? You've got a blue box outbreak someplace, right? What do you do about that? Because if you prosecute and it gets into the newspapers, you might well have just done yourself more harm than good. Now everybody in that area reads about it and says, oh, what's a blue box? That sounds pretty good. I'd like to be able to make free phone calls. Okay, so uh, lots of interesting things there. Um, uh, let's, let's start with um, kind of where this left off, so that we have this problem here that um, when when uh, these vulnerabilities get out, um, on the one hand, um, you know, we, we don't necessarily want people to know that there's a vulnerability, but on the other hand, we want the people who are in the position of stopping it to, to know about it. So, um, Nicholas, I'm wondering if you could uh, touch on kind of how this is playing out now. Well, the interesting thing, I think, uh, in, uh, in, in the history is that you do see that the same human traits are, you know, always at the root of these problems. In the 60s, phone calls were expensive. People didn't want to spend money. And they developed very ingenious technology to circumvent that. Now, if you fast forward to, say, today, um, or maybe five years ago, movies, movie rentals were fairly expensive. People didn't want to spend that money, right? So the idea is that, you see, economic incentives do play a role, and I think this you know, is uh, actually what was touched on at the very end. What kind of a balancing act do you need to find so that for the operator it actually makes sense to disclose a vulnerability as opposed to uh, trying to conceal it as much as possible? And I think that, in fact, you know, the, the, the root of the problem is still the same today. It's just the technology has changed, but ultimately it's a game about economics. Sure. Um, so it, it's a, a very interesting clip because I think many of us are also smiling when we're looking at this and thinking how much simpler the world used to be than it is today. Uh, AT&T was a monopoly, as, as the movie pointed out. Uh, today, when you're looking at the infrastructure, it's really layers upon layers of technologies coming with so many different companies, and each one of these layers uh, is introducing potentially its own set of vulnerabilities. And so just keeping track of all these vulnerabilities is well beyond what uh, anyone can do, any organization, but even collectively, uh, I think uh, industry and government working together are not able to keep up. And so in this environment, uh, obviously, uh, the same questions remain. Obviously, what do we do when we discover vulnerabilities? And, and we know that uh, there are many companies out there that 
uh, try to entice people who discover these vulnerabilities to come forward, report them so that uh, uh, they have hopefully enough time to patch things up. Um, and so what's interesting in this space is you've got companies like uh, Facebook, I think, offering $500. Uh, just last, uh, last week, uh, Google paid $60,000 uh, for someone who uh, actually uh, found a vulnerability uh, in Chrome. This is an individual who accidentally had found another similar uh, vulnerability a few months earlier and had already received $60,000 uh, from Google. And so the question is, how far is this going to go? And uh, you might say for $60,000, a lot of people might be willing to come forward and essentially disclose these vulnerabilities to companies. And that was true until recently. But uh, the situation has changed. One of the nice things over the past 10 years was to see the level of cooperation taking place between government and industry. Uh, this is a, a drastic change from what we had seen earlier in the 90s. Uh, so I remember, for instance, when I worked at the European Commission, we had a number of meetings with industry. Uh, we would have uh, meetings also with the White House to discuss uh, critical infrastructure protection, etc. And so we created a very nice set of collaborations. But most recently, we've entered a new phase in this area, and this is cyber war. Uh, and when governments are also officially now in the business of conducting cyber war, their priorities are all of a sudden divided. Uh, if they discover vulnerabilities, they may not necessarily want to go and report them uh, to companies. Uh, they're essentially in a situation where, and this has been reported, uh, government might be willing to offer more than what industry can justify paying for some of these vulnerabilities, just for the sake and in hope that they're the only ones uh, to know about these exploits, and so that when the time comes, they might be able to take advantage of them. And so if anything, that creates a situation that's only worse, and I'm, I'm afraid that's probably going to be a theme of this panel. Things are only getting worse. So I'm going to stop here. Um, so so uh, what was motivating these early hackers was free phone calls uh, seemed to be a big motivator, and uh, although there also seemed to be just a, this is cool, I can do it. So yeah, the exploration definitely seems to be a factor as well. Um, and you guys are suggesting that perhaps one of the motivations now is that bounty that you might get for finding uh, these sorts of bugs. Um, how else are people monetizing their, their hacking these days, and what, what is driving them? Well, so I would say that you know it's, it's still a little bit the same thing. You're going to have a number, a fairly number, limited number of people that are interested in uh, hacking, by lack of a better word, just because it's cool and you know it's an exploratory process, and it's essentially it's research, right, to some extent. Uh, but you're going to have a lot of people that are perhaps less technically inclined that want to be able to piggyback and to free ride on that to monetize activities. And we do see the same thing uh, today. You have a fairly, I wouldn't say it's a limited number, but you have a small number in comparison of people who actually really know what they're doing. And you have quite a lot of people that don't necessarily know what they're doing, but that are using what the smart guys produce as a commodity. And this is part of the problem that we have nowadays. Uh, back in the 60s, if you wanted to learn about phone freaking, you had to talk to somebody who knew what they were doing, uh, perhaps one of your friends. Nowadays, if you want to, say, install an exploit kit on a machine, you have to find essentially where to buy it from. And it doesn't really need a lot of skills to actually be able to deploy that thing. And in fact, some people may even be willing to do that for you. So the only thing that you're doing is arbitrage. Um, and that's, to me, one of the reasons why we may think that the problem is uh, somewhat worse, but at the heart of it, you still see the same distinction between people that are in it for perhaps uh, ideological purposes, some people that are in it just because it's interesting to do, and some people that are in it just because, well, they want to make money or save money. I guess I'm next. So. Um we're obviously continuing to see uh, people hacking for fun, but that's not what uh, uh, most uh, CISOs uh, are um, awake at night. Uh, that's not the main reason for uh, CISOs to remain awake at night. Uh, what we've seen over the past uh, few years, really over the past uh, 10 plus years, uh, is a couple of new trends. One is uh, cybercrime really taking over and the emergence of increasingly complex value chains when it comes to different actors essentially contributing uh, to different types of attacks, from people identifying exploits uh, to people enabling these exploits to people 
uh, controlling botnets and making these botnets available uh, to people. There's an entire black economy that has uh, developed and that has made it, on the one hand, much easier uh, for people to launch attacks and made it also possible for people to launch attacks on a much larger scale than what was previously uh, possible. Uh, just uh, again a couple of weeks ago, a number of major banks here in the U.S. were subjected to denial of service attacks that were absolutely unprecedented, just showing how many botnets they were effectively be able, being, be, uh, able to control. Uh, and um, there are various estimates out there, but uh, it's not far-fetched to believe that somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of all computers today have been compromised and might actually be part of botnets. That's the scale uh, that we're talking about. Uh, the other interesting trend in this space has been obviously uh, what people refer to as APTs or advanced persistent threats. And this is something that worries uh, many, many companies and governments as well. It's essentially the idea that we've, we're moving away from the one-off attack where you're going to say, well, let me try a bunch of different banks. Some of them might not fall for my attack, others might. And then I'll move on and perhaps try something else. Nowadays, what you're seeing increasingly, and this applies to many, many organizations. I don't think that this is only the Fortune 10 or the Fortune 50. It's much broader than that. We're seeing essentially targeted attacks launched at companies day after day after day with these attacks being fine-tuned over time until people get in, right? And people just don't give up. So you're constantly under attack uh, today. These APTs, these advanced persistent threats become increasingly uh, sophisticated. And they've been the source of many, um, many breaches that have made the headlines. Think about uh, RSA, uh, think about uh, Sony, think about uh, the White House, right? I mean, there are just so many examples. And again, think also about government. So it's not just... Uh, cybercrime organizations behind this. Increasingly, the belief is that governments are behind this. So an example of another type of APT is the Stuxnet attack that was launched, uh, we believe now, uh, by Israel and the United States jointly to essentially uh, get the Iranian nuclear program uh, to fall behind by something like 18 months. And so those are the types of attacks that we're seeing today. And that's a very ma major change from the early days where uh, it was in part to impress your friends, in part for some kind of financial gain, but nothing on the scale of what we're seeing today. You want to show us the next clip? Sure. If I could, well, I don't remember exactly how I had these ordered, <laughs> to be completely honest. <laughs> There is no right to privacy in this country. Let me just say that out loud. Uh, it's not in the Constitution. It's not in any of the Bill of Rights or any other amendment. There is no right to privacy. The way it is now, I don't own my own identity. If I give it to Facebook, they own it. I can't go back to them and say, you know what? I want to change that. I don't want that to be visible anymore. They say, too bad. You gave it to us. It's in our systems. It's there forever. Uh, we're going to sell it, we're going to monetize it, we're going to create psychographic you know, analysis of who our users are so we can better target advertising to them. People think that they're the customers of Facebook or Google or LiveJournal or Twitter. In, in fact, they're not. Right? They're the products of these companies that they sell to their customers who are the advertisers. Right? The reason Facebook is free, the reason Gmail is free, is not because the company likes you. It's because you are their product. And by making it free, they get a better product that they can sell to their advertisers. Over the last few years, we've heard the CEOs of uh, several major technology companies talk about the death of privacy. Eric Schmidt of Google talks about it. Larry Ellison of Oracle. Uh, we're hearing it from uh, Mort Zuckerberg of Facebook, that the rules of privacy are changing and people expect less privacy. What's interesting is those are the very CEOs that are deliberately undermining privacy. At a presentation to advertisers in 2007, Mark Zuckerberg pitched the benefits of Facebook's vast database. On Facebook, we know exactly what gender someone is and exactly how old they are and exactly what they're interested in. We're finding a very slow and deliberate ratcheting down of privacy from all of these companies because they make money from people sharing, from information being visible, from information being collated and networked and being seen by others. Should I pause it until we get the projector back? Yes. Unless everybody just wants to turn around. <laughs> A lot of my friends have grown up with nothing but computers. That's all they know are computers. Well, starting with them, there's an electronic digital record of everything they've ever done online. 
Now, whether or not the record is kept, somebody deletes the hard drive or throws away the backup tapes, fine. But records are being kept. Hard drive data storage is cheap. It'll be around forever. So can you imagine the implications? How does that change your behavior if everything you've ever done is recorded somewhere? Can you imagine what the presidential debates will be like 20, 30 years from now when they're pulling up your first tweet, your first Facebook love note, your first status change on Google Talk where you said you were going to go get hammered? I mean, it's fundamentally going to change the way the people behave. I mean, there's a common myth that privacy is about something to hide. I don't have anything to hide, so I don't need privacy. But you know that's not true. I mean, we don't have anything to hide when we, uh, you know, sing in the shower or write a love letter and then tear it up. You know, privacy is about uh, us as individuals. It's about our ability to be who we are without necessarily telling everybody. I mean, when someone says, I have nothing to hide, just ask them, what's your salary? What are your sexual fetishes? You know, what kind of diseases do you have? I mean, these, it's not about hiding, it's about personal dignity. I listen to NPR, so I mean, I could just listen to the phone. Yeah. No, that, that, that was it okay. uh, for that clip. Okay. Okay. A footnote on that really quick is that privacy was this kind of bizarre animal that I had to grapple with with this film because I knew I was going to get the kind of <sighs> from, you know, the industry experts when I started to, you know, make these declarative statements about Facebook that, you know, seem so obvious to probably most of the people in this room. But uh, again, it's this kind of idea that people don't necessarily understand the technology that they're using and it, that was one of the motivations for me doing the film was that we are all kind of immersed in this technology but the only thing that 90% of the population really understand is how to use the interface that they're engaging with and that's the depth of it. So is privacy dead? Anybody want to take a stand? <laughs> I don't think so. Uh, so it, it, it's clear that uh, just like in security, privacy is changing and, and our privacy is certainly under attack and attitudes are also changing. Uh, it's not by accident that today you have a billion people who are on Facebook. Uh, many of these people realize that uh, they're disclosing a lot more information than they used to before Facebook existed and clearly they're happy enough about doing this at some level uh, that they're continuing, right? Uh, but uh, the big mistake and, and uh, the statement that has been made about privacy being dead is essentially a very dangerous con conclusion. It's not because you've got a billion people on Facebook that you should conclude that privacy has died, just like it's not because we're all under attack from a security, security perspective that should declare that security is dead too. We could do that, but I don't think that we're ready to do it for security. I don't think we should be ready to do it for privacy. Uh, we've done many experiments in our lab over the past 10 years looking at privacy across many different contexts, including contexts that are being mediated by uh, Facebook, looking, for instance, at location sharing. And it's very clear that people find value in sharing more information about them, but it's also very clear that they want to be very selective about how they do that, with whom, under which conditions. And so privacy, if anything, just like security, is becoming more complex. And so it's not dead. It's just more challenging. If I, if I can add something to that, I think that what is happening right now with uh, social networks in general is actually making privacy a relevant debate again. People get a lot more aware about what's happening. For instance, there is that um, web page that is devoted to people who lost employment due to stupid things that they did on Facebook. And I think that we will see more and more of those um, expositions of, I wouldn't say privacy violation because, uh, well, people put that information online in the first place, no one coerced them to do so, but of those privacy mishaps, perhaps. Um, and I do think that people become a lot more aware of uh, the fact that, well, they need to be a little bit careful and a little bit smart because it's not so much that they're disclosing stuff about themselves. People have been doing that forever. The problem is that, and that was pointed out in the clip, this goes down on your permanent record. And 20 years from now, 
I think that the quote about you know, the presidential election of uh, 2040 or so is going to be really interesting. <laughs> it's going to be really interesting when people manage to mine some data about what the guy said when he was 15. Um, so I don't think that privacy is dead. I think that privacy is becoming actually a more pressing problem for people than it was perhaps 20 years ago because now people realize that, well, there are some threats to uh, their, their privacy. They're not fully aware of it yet. It's going to take a few years, I think, of, 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 uh, of bad events happening. But I do think that people start realizing that this is something that they actually may value. And they may be interested in, you know, again, going back to the economic theme, they may be able to assess, assess some economic value of their private information and then perhaps do something to protect that private information. So in order to make sure that we don't continue in down this spiral and lose all our privacy, is, is it necessary um, for anything to happen? Um, do, you, do you think that uh, uh, naturally people are going to you know, realize that they're posting stupid things and that they should stop and, and uh, you know, block advertisers from tracking them and things like that and, and everything will just work itself out? Or, or do we need government perhaps to intervene and do something or technology companies to start behaving in a different way? Um, you know, wh where is this going and, and, and what can we do to actually um, have some control over where it's going? I just wanted to say, I, I think one of the reasons that social networking is the phenomena that it is, is that it democratizes popularity. Before you needed to be rich or famous or some kind of arch criminal to be in the kind of limelight on that scope that people can achieve on Facebook with their 3,000 friends and constant posts to uh, their other friends and so on and so forth is this democratization of popularity and people like to grandstand. And when that opportunity is given to them where is in history it wasn't there before, they're going to take advantage of it, of course. So I think one of the challenges that we're faced with is that the world is just changing so fast. And so from a privacy standpoint, we all enjoy our smartphones, we all enjoy going on Facebook, we all enjoy having a chance to be famous, just uh, like people who traditionally would have been much more famous than, than we are. Uh, but it's also very hard for us uh, to keep up with all the implications of our activities. And this applies both to security again and privacy. Right? Very few people fully understand the ramifications of posts that they're making on Facebook, of information that they're sharing, of things that they are agreeing to doing, again, from potentially a security standpoint, just as well as a privacy standpoint. So they, there's clearly a need for people to catch up in some manner. That's going to be very challenging because of the variety of different scenarios today that are being mediated by technologies, the number of different opportunities for information about us to be collected. People look at their smartphones and they don't think about privacy by default. They think about the next app they're going to be able to download and how they're going to be able to impress their friends by essentially showing up the app or sharing some additional information with, with people on, on Facebook. And so there is a, a very significant effort uh, that will have to be undertaken to educate people. It's not something that's going to happen overnight and it's something that each of us as individuals will have to somehow uh, take some responsibility for. The government can just not step in and enact some kind of law that will require all of us to better understand the privacy, privacy implication. The government could help, no question. I think there would certainly be value in having slightly stricter regulations, but one has to also be realistic about how much government is willing to do given the existing political system uh, that we live in. The government uh, has also, at the end of the day, very limited uh, very limited capability to influence things also when it passes regulations. Think about what we've done, for instance, in the financial sector or in the healthcare sector. I mean, we have privacy laws that by and large are comparable to what you find in Europe in those specific sectors, right? And yet, what do you do when you get these disclosures in the mail? How many of you actually read them, right? And so clearly, uh, we need to move beyond these traditional solutions. And so ultimately, I think what is going to take to respond to these new challenges that we face with in privacy in particular will be a mix 
of uh, probably new technology, some amount of regulation, some amount of self-discipline from industry. How quickly can we get there? And you know, are people really willing to invest the time and effort to get us there? This is still an open question. Things are moving very fast in this space. Well, I think you know to add to, add to this, um, I do believe that education is going to be key. Um, so to go back to the, uh, the issue of government regulation, um, governments are usually here to help assist when there are you know complete market failure cases where the market cannot guarantee anything. But other than that, they tend to not really. Well, it depends on the government, but at least in the United States, they tend to not like very much to intervene. Uh, and the reason is, well, if you have a business or an aspect of the economy that creates jobs, that creates growth, you don't want to overregulate it and perhaps kill, you know, the golden goose. So there's a tension, you know, at the government level. But again, that goes back to the question of economic incentives and specifically in that case, uh, with a little bit more education, people would perhaps realize that they value more their privacy, and then that would lead them to perhaps search for alternatives, or maybe not. You know, an experiment was run a couple of years ago. Uh, people were told to download a program that would give them access for free music in exchange to doing some unconscionable things to their privacy. Essentially, you know, you were surrendering your machine and giving it to, uh, to somebody else. Most people decided that you know what, I want the free music. So perhaps that's because they didn't really understand the consequences of their actions. We still need to, know, to understand a little bit better how all of this plays out. Uh, but I think that down the road, what's gonna happen is that people will make educated choices, provided that they have that education, provided that they are aware of the consequences of their actions. And then, whether or not we'll need regulation for the most extreme cases or just because we have a market failure situation, that remains to be seen. Right now, actors in the market don't understand the market itself. I wanted to see if there are any questions in the audience before we move on to the next clip. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, hold, hold, hold that down while you talk. of, oh, I guess it's turned on now, um, there's the possibilities of living off the grid, which I've had some friends do who just wanted to disconnect and just did that, and I have no idea where they are now at this point. And then there's uh, also, you know, the, the fact that there's, there hasn't been quite as much like a, of a technological uh, revolution in some areas, so people are still able to kind of live off the grid per se. Um, I mean, of course, I think you made a really good point about people not really being educated enough to know that this is what I'm giving up when I sign up for these kind of things. So I was kind of curious how you would see it as, uh, I didn't know if you guys were talking mainly like first world or if you guys were actually talking about it on a global scale about privacy kind of, you know, being something that's, you know, people can't decide if it's alive or dead at this point. It's, it's clear that uh, the challenges that we're talking about in, in the area of privacy are directly related to uh, economic progress and uh, the fact that uh, technology these days, in particular IT, is pervading uh, everything. And so this is clearly much more the case in uh, developed countries than uh, in countries that are um, you know, behind in terms of development. Uh, but at the same time, think about uh, smartphones, yeah. right? So smartphones today, uh, you know, pretty much everyone has them. There are over six billion people with cell phones, they're not smartphones. Uh, here in the US, we've passed the stage where 50% of our cell phone users are effectively smartphone users. So technology is rapidly catching up. Why? Because the story for the past few decades has been technology becoming cheaper, right? A memory becoming cheaper, uh, computers becoming cheaper, everything is becoming cheaper. And so this is also what is leading us into this world of pervasive computing, right? Where increasingly everything around you will be uh, embedded with uh, computing, uh, processing, memory, sensing, actuation uh, capability. It's going to be very hard to interact with this world without at some point leaving some information behind. Uh, in the movie, there is a, a very interesting segment 
uh, where you see a baby who's just born, and I think the, the, the storyline says this baby is only about two seconds old, and you see essentially uh, a footprint being made uh, for that child. And so this is actually a, a pretty old uh, uh, movie, if I remember correctly. Uh, it looks like it's uh, dating probably 30 or 40 years ago, and clearly things have changed quite a bit. So if you're planning to give birth at a hospital, no, you don't necessarily have to, right away, uh, you're going to become part of the system. Right away, information will be collected about you. And it's no longer going to just be a print on a piece of paper. You can trust me, it's going to be digitized. So living off the grid, maybe, but uh, you know, increasingly difficult. Well, in regards to it being a first world problem or not, I think right now it definitely is. But I also know that in uh, some parts of Africa, Kenya and South Africa come to mind, uh, people use cell phones, not smartphones, cell phones as a substitute for the banking system, which means that there is a demand over there as well for technology. And again, people that engage in that don't think about privacy. They just want to exchange money. And it's the least of their worries whether or not this is being traced or not. Now, turn the problem in its head and ask yourself, you know, if you're looking at a country that has serious economic problems, what kind of and I'm sorry to be cynical, but you know you have to think sometimes like a corporation. What kind of value does the corporation get from the private information of those users? They're not going to buy anything, right? So uh, I think that it's going to be com committent with economic development. As soon as you're going to have economic development, those problems are going to occur because of the pervasiveness of technology and the fact that technology is cheap and can very often represent an alternative to previous technology that wasn't as cheap. Specifically, the banking infrastructure is you know, greatly simplified by, uh, by those devices. I just wanted to add something to that, um, that I think in the third world countries, um, they haven't had good ways of tracking individuals in the past. And there's a lot of reasons why um, governments want to track people for some very good reasons, um, for public health and um, you know, to, to understand where to allocate resources. Um, and now with um, cell phones being so pervasive, they finally have a mechanism to actually track people. There was actually an article on the front page of the Post-Gazette this morning about some Carnegie Mellon research in Africa using cell phone data to track um, disease propagation in Africa. Um, so great work, great use of the data, but now we, we actually have this data about people um, that, that is available. And I suspect that um, in, in our eagerness to you know, use this data and to try to you know, help solve some really tough problems, um, people aren't necessarily thinking about, oh, well, there's some privacy implications of this and maybe we should be careful with the data. And, and so I think what is currently very much a first world, world problem now really has the potential to become a third world problem as well. Any other questions? Yeah. From a government perspective, there is a clear conflict between privacy and security. No, uh, we have we have been hearing that uh, regulators are planning to release new laws with respect to uh, empower governments to monitor even more uh, users. On the other hand, there are also some bills related to privacy. So, how do you think these things balance out uh, from a government perspective? Just again, it's uh, there's so many great comments that are being made and. Uh, I, I can't jump in there constantly and say, well, the film addresses that, just not in the clips that I brought today. Uh, but yes, that's something that the film addresses, as well as this kind of evolution of motivation with in the coming of the information technology age that we talked about earlier, but this balance of privacy and security. And Bruce Schneier, who, for those of you who are you know familiar with him, um, I'm sure probably most of you are, the guy with the beard up there, uh, he actually thinks and expresses so in the film that uh, good security uh, actually works harmoniously with privacy. It's only bad security that goes into opposition to privacy. And he chooses the TSA as a perfect example, which we all know, if you know Bruce, you know he doesn't like the TSA, and he says uh, just... Look at airplane security, he said. After 9-11, there's been exactly two things that have improved security. One, the reinforcement of the cockpit door. Two, passengers knowing they have to fight back. Neither one of those have anything to do with privacy. And what the TSA is doing in his argument is this kind of security theater, this coined um, phrase that he has come up with. But uh, 
again, that's, you know, in a nutshell, what the film addresses in terms of that question. So come back tonight at 7 or 10 p.m. and see the film. <laughs> I'd like to perhaps uh, slightly disagree, uh, just to make things more interesting. So I, I cannot completely disagree with what Bush Schneier uh, said. Obviously, you cannot disagree with Bush Schneier. Um, <laughs> but sure you can. If, if you look at what happened, again, over the past 10 years, uh, if you look at 9-11, if you look also at uh, the threats that we're currently looking at in terms of massive attacks or on our cyber infrastructure and the consequences that we've faced. We've moved away from situations where attacks would be fairly limited potentially in scope and in scale. And so if you're the government and your responsibility is to look out for people, and no question that there are lots of gimmicks there, and, and, and I'm certainly not going to argue with that, but if you're the government, it's much more challenging because you're potentially looking at the prospect of devastating attacks. And so you're very desperate uh, to try and anticipate these attacks. And if you look at uh, the cyber, uh, cyber space today, it, it's still, by and large, much less regulated than uh, the physical world, right? So 9-11, people had to cross uh, borders uh, to come and attack us, right? The attacks that were launched uh, just a couple of weeks ago on our banks, nobody had to cross uh, borders. Uh, and so that uh, sort of puts us in a very different situation. It's a very complex issue. Uh, the gimmicks clearly have absolutely no use except to help politicians get reelected. Uh, but the idea that good security is compatible with good privacy, I can only agree with the concept, except that good security is just not easy. And, and so occasionally governments would be tempted to err on potentially infringing on our privacy. And how much of that we're willing to tolerate is an open question. Uh, a question that we as a society have to figure out, and it's a very challenging question. So I think we're about out of time, so I think we're going to go ahead and wrap it up now. Um, but uh, you know, you're welcome to come up and, and ask further questions up here.